<laughs> All right, we're recording now. Uh, Dr. Usama Fayed is chairman at Open Insight, focusing on artificial intelligence, machine learning, big data, data strategy, and new business mo models for data. He's the inaugural executive director of the Institute for Experiential AI at Northeastern University, where he is also the professor, a professor of computer science at Corey College. Usama was global chief data officers at Barclays Bank in London after launching a key tech startup accelerator in the Middle East in North Africa as executive chairman of Oasis 500. He was chairman, CTO, uh, and CEO of several uh, Seattle and Silicon Valley tech startups and the first person to hold the title of chief data officer at Yahoo um, when they acquired his second startup in 2004. He's held leadership roles at Microsoft and founded the Machine Learning System Group at NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab, uh, where he was awarded Caltech's Top Excellence in Research Award and a US government medal from NASA. Uh, Usama has published over 100 technical articles, holds over 30 patents, is a fellow of both the Associ Association for Advancement of Artificial Intelligence and the Association of Computing Machinery. He's a recipient of both the ACM Special Interest Group on Knowledge Discovery and Data Mining Awards for Innovation and Service. Dr. Fayed earned his PhD from the University of Michigan. He holds two BSEs in Electrical and Computer Engineering, has an MSc in Computer Engineering, and a Master's of Science in Mathematics. And a fun note to wrap up Usama's bio, uh, he is the host of a monthly podcast featuring prominent data leaders across industries. Uh, it's called Legends of Data and AI. I listened to it on my commute this morning and I highly recommend tuning in. Before I hand it over to Dr. Fayed, I want to encourage everyone to post your questions in the chat throughout the presentation. And um, we'll try to save some time at the end to address as many as possible. Usama, please go ahead, take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. And uh, thanks, everybody, for uh, joining. I'm going to try to share my screen now and see if that successfully works. <clears throat> um, so what I'll, what I'll talk about today, and, and I'll try to reserve, we're definitely going to reserve you know, a good 15 minutes at the end to answer questions. I'm really eager to hear questions. But my main goal here is to demystify uh, artificial intelligence. You know, artificial intelligence has gotten a lot of hype. Everybody uh, knows it's a it's a big deal. Uh, very few kind of understand what what is reality versus the hype, and what can we do to uh, kind of uh, fix the situation. So uh, with that, um, my goals here are kind of um, addressing this big challenge, right? Uh, making AI work correctly is one of the grand challenges facing us today in almost every industry, in almost every field. Uh, <clears throat> digitization has taken hold and has been, of course, greatly accelerated with the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, AI has been a great and difficult challenge for many organizations to take on. Machine learning is the dominant part of AI, and we'll talk about why. Um, and of course, an obvious statement, machine learning has a huge dependence on data, which is what brings data in, in the uh, uh, picture as, as a big deal. So what I'll do today is I'll share with you a bunch of stories and I'll uh, sprinkle it with five lessons learned kind of from making AI work in the real world. So I'll be sharing those with you as I expose different, different topics. But we'll get into kind of the myths and realities about AI, the myths of data in the enterprise. And then, you know, what, where does the human uh, fit in the AI story? Uh, which kind of really is the point of what we're doing with the Institute for Experiential AI in terms of addressing, um, you know, how do we do AI with, with a human in the loop? And it's, it's a human-centered AI that both leverages uh, the knowledge of the human, which is absolutely essential. And that's one of the lessons you'll see, uh, as well as kind of make it fit. So let me start out by talking a little bit about digital transformation. Um, and I know that uh, <clears throat> uh, I'll use an example 
uh, from, from accounting. Um, if you go back 60, 70 years, you know, to be an accountant, you have to be good with these book, you know, with these big ledgers. You have to have a nice handwriting. Uh, you have to be able to do a lot of addition in your head, right? And, and your main job was to kind of record numbers in this, in this ledger, right? Um, if you look at accounting today, completely different. Almost none of the, uh, well, not, not most of the, what was considered kind of the hard skills you have to have, uh, have been transformed into a, fo a focus on the strategic side of it, right? And the computers now do much of that work of kind of recording numbers, adding numbers, displaying them correctly, all of that. Now, of course, now the accountant serves a much better purpose, which is, you know, are these expenses appropriate? Are these correct revenues? How do we book them? Where do we book them? Are there issues in the business? Much more strategic uh, uh, insights. Uh, and if, then if you ask the question, well, has this automation replaced humans? Have we replaced accountants? And the answer is no, we, we have more accountants today than we ever had in the history of human civilization. So, uh, it's, you know, digitization is not about uh, replacing humans, nor is AI, in my opinion. It's about kind of elevating uh, the role of what we do. So that's digitization. Of course, this has happened with everything. When it came to the pandemic, couldn't go to the store, you had to buy online and you had no other choice. Same with the restaurants going digital, same with banks going digital and, and what have you. And this, this kind of uh, brought a, a rapid culture change in terms of digitization, right? Um, the, the wisdom kind of over time was around risk aversion. Uh, let's, let's wait and see what others do. Let's not disrupt how we deal with our customers, all of that. Uh, when you got into a mode where if you're not digital, you're either dead or walking dead, uh, suddenly you were forced to kind of go digital at, at scale. Uh, and, and then people started saying, well, wait a second, this is actually working. And it's not so risky as, as we feared. Um, in fact, in many cases, it's, it's a better model, I would argue. Um, risk aver once risk aversion is, is overcome, you get wide acceptance of making digital a priority. Um, and as others um, struggle to digitize, kind of those enterprises that took on digital went into a hyper growth mode. And we've seen that in, in some of the crazy stuff that went on in the, in the stock markets and so forth. Now, at the same time, <clears throat> there's great examples from history of uh, what happens to an organization when they fail um, to digitize, right? Um, you know, Kodak, um, you know, they invented the digital, digital camera, but they didn't uh, take it seriously. Uh, they didn't think about what this meant to their business. Other, others thought about that. Uh, and what happened was this company at the age of 124 years old, essentially went, went bankrupt. And think about what they survived through, right? World wars, uh, you know, over a century of operations, being kind of a household name, uh, et cetera, for, for the longest time. Um, the, uh, another example recently in, in retail, JC Penney, uh, again, forced to go into uh, uh, bankruptcy at 118 years old, right? Again, uh, they were kind of laggards in terms of taking up uh, the, the digital model as opposed to their, their competition. Now, there's also great examples of people taking on digital and uh, hyper boosting their business. I'll use some here from financial services, since that's my main area of kind of uh, stories here, although we'll talk about retail, and we'll talk about a couple of other verticals. Uh, Vitality is a, a great insurance program by Discovery Insurance, uh, where they essentially used the wearables and they used some of the measurements that come from where you spend your money, i.e. do you buy gym memberships, all that kind of stuff, kind of food you buy, to kind of reduce costs uh, for their insurance business and deliver value to the customers who are willing to lead a healthier uh, uh, lifestyle. Uh, Capital One is a great example in the US of adopting marketing, especially digital marketing channels to hyper boost their business. And, um, you know, they got to a point where they were doing 80,000 uh, big data experiments a year, uh, uh, you know, achieving good degrees of, of uh, uh, accuracy. But 
and the major contribution here is a huge cost reduction factor, 83% cost reduction. Um, and in fact, that their CEO is, is quoted as, you know, I think it's a bit of a fool's errand to chase digital for the sake of cost reduction, because the value, even though they achieved so much cost reduction, the real value was business growth. Another great example I like is DBS, which is a bank you may not, never have heard of uh, in Singapore. 2017, that bank was essentially on the verge of uh, not existing anymore. They adopted a digital resolution, uh, turned the whole organization around, sorry, 2013. By 2017, they were uh, making a lot of profit, uh, big growth, and now they are the biggest bank in uh, the Singapore market. Again, an example of what, how digital can transform in a, in a big way. Now, something interesting happens. Uh, and I call this uh, kind of digital without data leads to blindness. You, you lose customer intimacy when you go digital. Why? Because most uh, digitizations are all about uh, workflow automation, right? Hey, we want to take this process and make it all you know, automatic, uh, all done by machines. Well, guess what? Um, uh, you, even though the human uh, channel for processing uh, these workflows, maybe it was inefficient, maybe it was uh, uh, you know, not scaling, et cetera, it had one nice advantage. These humans had a unique capability to understand, you know, are customers happy? Uh, are the services and products satisfying what they need? Why are they leaving us? Who are they leaving us to? Uh, what is making customers unhappy, right? A lot of that, and, and what does it take to delight them? A lot of that kind of goes away. And of course, the hope now is you say, okay, I've digitized the processes. I've taken those humans out of the loop, but now I've kind of, I'm going blind. How do we restore this? And of course the answer is, is data, right? And data is a substitute, if you like, for gathering that information, understanding what is going on, where is the process breaking down? Uh, why is a customer leaving? Uh, it kind of starts to serve as our eyes and ears in a, in a completely digitized format. Uh, talking about banks in particular, right? An another favorite example of mine, banks of 100 years ago, a highly uh, branch focused, uh, very local, which is what, what they should be. But you know that, that branch manager and the staff knew the customers really well. They knew who was a good credit risk. They knew who was going through trouble. They knew who's, uh, whose business is prospering. They knew who's trying to go to college, buy a horse, what have you. And a lot of the things when the banks went digital, be they front office in terms of you know, cross-selling and getting customers to do more, or back office, things like, you know, we don't think about it, KYC, know your customer, um, you know, ensuring that uh, the transaction is legal and compliant with the regulation. Uh, at a bank like Barclays, where I was the global chief data officer, you know, that was a cost of something like 200 million pounds a year just to stay on top of KYC. Um, finance reporting was something like 300 million pounds a year, right? Of cost of kind of doing a lot of manual uh, reconciliation and, and, and gathering information and so forth for the reporting. So <clears throat> what used to be kind of simple is now suddenly because of digitization and scale, much more complex, requiring much more technology. Uh, an example here, uh, say for with an insurance company, let's say Kelly is a customer. Um, and Kelly kind of buys new home insurance coverage with her husband. Well, um, <clears throat> typically, okay, I, I got the uh, home insurance, end of story. Now, if you think about it, the insurance company knows a lot more, right? They know Kelly just got married, right? Recently wedded. Uh, Kelly is starting a new family. Uh, Kelly is thinking of buying a new and bigger car, right? All of these are, for example, great opportunities for that insurance company to understand what the customer is about, even though the transaction was limited in scope, because they have to collect that data and they get it automatically. Uh, so what they could have done is basically uh, figure out, hey, home insurance, uh, uh, you know, auto insurance is relevant here, family insurance, things relating to savings, et cetera. Um, the big point in this picture is that digitization produces a heck of a lot more data, right? Uh, as you start measuring that data because you're trying to understand whether your digital processes are working, whether your customers are happy or whether your 
uh, businesses are kind of using it correctly. Um, it moves us from what we used to call it the economy of transactions to, to the new economy of interactions. And interactions are kind of rich with unstructured data. In fact, uh, you know, Gartner says 90% of the data in any organization is unstructured. And we'll talk about the fact that uh, uh, most organizations don't know how to utilize it, uh, the unstructured data. Uh, without proper data, AI cannot work. And we're gonna get into that in detail. Uh, machine learning, which is the working part of AI these days, needs high quality and granular data at levels that are typically not uh, collected when you do it for humans. So as we shift into AI, and since my, one of my goals is to demystify AI, what is AI? Uh, uh, and what is its relevance to the uh, digital transformation? First of all, it's an old concept. It's been around for a long time. I would argue more than hundred years. Uh, the name officially got adopted in, in the 1956 workshop. <clears throat> um, despite much hype and fear, uh, there were few practical successes in the first 40 years of AI. Um, and, and the excessive hype has led through the history of AI uh, to two previous AI winters. Uh, what that means is people get disillusioned, the funding is cut, uh, companies stop investing because they say, hey, there were a lot of promises and nothing was delivered. Uh, and, and practitioners start avoiding the field. The experts kind of fly away. Uh, the first AI winter was in the mid seventies. The second AI winter was in the early nineties, right when I was actually graduating with a PhD in AI and machine learning, uh, where people were actually actively saying, hey, I never worked on AI, right? It was that bad of a winter. Um, <clears throat> what is it? What is AI? And we'll talk about these, these uh, 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 winters and, and how to survive them. Uh, well, AI is about using computers to simulate human intelligence. Seems like a very simple definition, but extremely tricky. First of all, defining intelligence uh, has been a challenge to this day. We don't know how to define it. Alan Turing struggled with it, came up with the Turing test, um, and, and, and you know, quickly we realized every definition we tried to make doesn't seem to capture uh, what it takes to call something intelligent. Um, and then think simple things like common sense reasoning, right? Stuff that you know, even kids do, right? And, and I would argue some, some uh, small animals do. Uh, we can't get computers to do, right? And we'll, we'll talk about examples of that common sense reasoning. Uh, what about machine learning? Well, it's a subset of AI concerned with machines modifying or learning behaviors based on experience, based on inputs. Uh, what we call training data. And this is where data comes in in a big way. So we'll talk about that as well. Um, so what happened in the first generation of AI solutions? Well, uh, we underestimated common sense reasoning. We underestimated the difficulty of natural language understanding. Uh, we used mathematical logic to try to model the world and realized, hey, that didn't work out. Uh, it was too restrictive uh, and too inefficient. Uh, yet, Many applications that work emerged, expert systems and scheduling, manufacturing, travel bookings, and a lot of game players. And we'll come back to game players, you know, chess and checkers and so forth. Um, 1980s and 90s, the second AI winter, well, common sense reasoning continued to be too challenging. We still don't know how to do it to this day. Natural language understanding continues to be uh, disappointing from an understanding perspective, yet today we have very powerful NLP tools and we'll talk about that, natural language processing. Um, severe underestimation of the uh, difficulty of what we call grand challenge problems. So machine vision was one of these grand challenge problems. Can a computer understand a picture, a scene, and what's in it? Um, and to this day, that's still a huge challenge, by the way. Uh, probabilistic reasoning, uh, was better than uh, uh, capturing a lot of nuances of and uncertainties in the world, but did not scale uh, enough. What we learned is that the problem <clears throat> was worse. It seemed like you needed to know everything about a domain before you could be intelligent in it. Now that may sound impossible, but it's not. And, and I'll, I'll uh, come back to that. So that leads us to lesson number one, right? Uh, the, the way to make something work in AI is you want to reduce the problem domain to one where complete knowledge is possible by narrowing the scope down to a point where you know everything, right? Uh, as an example of this, even though it sounds impossible, take a chessboard, right? If you're trying to do a chess player, 
If I gave you the chess configuration and the rules, that's it. You know everything. You have complete knowledge of the domain, right? If I move outside chess, you know very little to nothing, right? But inside chess, you, you have complete knowledge and that's how you, you get to the solutions. Same happened in kind of robotic automation in, in, in manufacturing, in a factory where you kind of narrow the engineering task to one that is extremely specific, very repetitive, et cetera. And then a robot uh, has complete knowledge of what can happen in that very controlled environment. Right? Now a robot in an uncontrolled environment is a whole different story. So what about these big problems, these big challenge problems like machine vision? Well, let's take an example. Um, let's say you wanna take a picture of a basket and figure out what's in it based on that. Well, very difficult machine vision problem. There's occlusion, there's different angles, different lighting, all of that. Uh, how did we solve this problem? Well, <laughs> if you think about it, every supermarket does this today, but they do it through uh, a barcode, right? So with a barcode reader, I could read it in the dark, uh, in bad conditions, at bad angles, very rapidly, much faster than humans. Uh, and in fact, it became a joke in machine vision. Hey, we solved the machine vision problem. All you have to do is slap barcodes on every object in real life and, and you're done, right? That's how a machine would recognize what's in the scene. Uh, does this have any relation to how humans see? The answer is no, right? The challenge, the grand challenge problem was how do people see and understand images? We haven't answered that question but we actually solved the engineering problem, right? So a lot of these AI solutions are of that ilk. Um, the hype continues, by the way, in our third wave of AI now, right? We had two winters, wave one, winter one, wave two, winter two, and now we're in wave three. Lots of hype uh, continues, you know, to US uh, in, in, the, in the second uh, winter, the US was afraid of Japan AI program called the fifth generation systems. Uh, of course, that didn't amount to anything. Substitute that today with China 20 to 30 AI. Uh, that's the new kind of big thing to fear. Um, Everybody is running around saying, hey, we're all going to be jobless, brainless. And in reality, this is not, this is not the case because we can't, we can't get these machines to be as intelligent as, as humans. So all of this is going to lead. And my prediction personally is within five years, we're going to see the third AI winter. So uh, winter is coming. Uh, the good news is though, in, in the past two AI winters that we've been through, one field seemed to have survived both of them, and this is machine learning. And I'll spend a few minutes talking about why, and then we'll go back and start talking about use cases and examples, case studies. Um, so we said this is a subset of AI concerns with machine learning from, from data. Uh, there were very true early successes in this. Um, my favorite example, and still continues to be to this day my favorite, even though it's from the late 50s, uh, is uh, work done by Arthur Samuel, who worked for IBM. And yes, behind him are kind of those mainframes with the real tapes, and these are the computers he had access to. And you see him there sitting with a checkers board. So Samuel's like checkers. Uh, he figured, hey, uh, what if I wrote a program that kind of learned by playing with me, right? And he started playing with this program that adjusted itself after every win or loss. It just adjusted some weights, right, in a formula. And suddenly it was playing better than Samuel himself, right? But not only that, he had the deeper insight of saying, well, what happens if I fed it um, the championship games in the New York area, right? And sure enough, this thing started playing and defeating champions, right? So uh, that simple learning technique, which iteratively just you know, does something, sees whether it's won or lost, adjusts how it scores a board position to worse or better. And that helps it, you know, pursue board positions that are better according to its metric. That became kind of an easy trick to play better than uh, the best ch uh, checkers players out there. Um, and and uh, it's the only field of, of AI that kind of survived both winters in a very healthy state. <clears throat> it became critical to many areas. Uh, today, you know, the largest scale machine learning implementation on the planet, in my opinion, is search engines, right? The Google search engine. No one understands how Google, how that engine ranks uh, uh, the relevance. You know, you, you put in your 2.3 average phrase, 2.3 keywords in the search engine, and it searches, you know, hundreds of billions of documents and comes up with the top 10 or 20 that are likely to contain the match. 
that is all determined through a machine learning algorithm that requires a lot of manual feedback and a lot of people every day telling it, hey, move this up, move this down, et cetera. There's actually staff whose job is to do that. And that's crunched through a machine learning uh, program that essentially is, is the only black box that understands how the ranking engine, the relevance ranking works. Um, uh, many problems uh, are, are solved uh, today uh, utilizing approaches like this with the human in the loop where training data can actually drive uh, and, and that uh, 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 deep solutions and that took us into deep learning. Um, <clears throat> and deep learning is essentially think of it as a second generation of a very, very simple computing device, like a neural network, a perceptron. But if you do it at scale with a lot of these uh, 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 perceptrons connected uh, both in, in a huge input space as well as a, a deep uh, uh, propagation space. Uh, basically, you take a simple neural network of the 80s, uh, you add a heck of a lot more layers in depth as well as layers in breadth, and then you do a lot of training with a lot of compute and a lot of data. And the savior here has been the latter, the lots of data. Uh, that's a key in allowing it to do a nonlinear regression, which is very, very hard to do statistically manually or through traditional kind of regression, linear regression techniques. Uh, so being able to do this uh, nonlinear regression at scale has resulted in a lot of the fields of AI, basically whether you're doing translation or uh, uh, speech understanding or image recognition or machine vision, a lot of these got replaced with machine learning as the shortcut, right? We don't know how to solve this machine vision thing. Oh, we can get a, a, a network to learn how to do it and we can get to a solution. So a lot of these tasks, especially in NLP, natural language processing are being done now with a lot of these big uh, learning uh, uh, models, and language models and so forth. Um, the, the key here is we don't really have better algorithms, right? There's been advances on algorithms, but nowhere near matching the advances on how much more data we have. So we don't have better algorithms, we just have more data is one of my favorite quotes uh, due to my friend here in Norway at Google. Um, there's many practical uh, use and useful applications. Uh, it's a serious presence and opportunity, by the way, and I don't mean, I don't mean to dismiss it. Uh, recommender systems are everywhere. There's interesting applications like Erica and Mathematica. There's embarrassing ones like Microsoft Pay. Uh, if you haven't heard about it, uh, Microsoft put up this chat box and, and challenged the community, hey, why don't you interact with it? And what happened is people were able to hack it within days uh, by speaking to it in certain ways, using bad language. Uh, they not only got it to start using bad language consistently, but to kind of go into racial slurs and other things like that, which was very embarrassing. So it got shut down and Microsoft pretended it never happened. Uh, there's promising and overhyped solutions like IBM Watson and there is powerful uh, truly uh, amazing solutions like IBM Deep Blue, which can play chess better than the best chess players uh, in the world, uh, better than the best grandmaster. Um, so what is so special about uh, machine learning? We said this, which is the fact that we have a lot more data and that 90% of the data is unstructured, which by the way, is a big deal here because most organizations still live in a structured only SQL it requires data to be structured in, in tables and relations. And that's a big limitation. Lesson number two in pragmatic AI is data is a necessary enabler of practical applied AI. So make sure the data is captured and managed as an asset. Uh, in many cases, it's very hard to say whether it's an asset or a liability. Uh, in fact, in many organizations, I argue they store a lot of data, but it's sitting there as a liability waiting to be uh, externally hacked or internally leaked, uh, which are both huge risks. Uh, we've seen a lot of the big security risks there. Uh, there's a lot of myths around kind of trying to um, uh, mask the data and make it private and you know hide identity. It turns out that's a much harder problem. Uh, a nice way to visualize it is, you know, uh, I could mask a face in this picture, but to an algorithm, look, if you look at the surround as a human, you immediately know who's behind that masked face, who the person is exactly. But uh, uh, often we don't realize that to a machine, when you give it access to a lot of data, no matter how much masking you do, there's a lot of ways to triangulate your way to the, to the true identity and, and break the privacy. 
Um, a third lesson is machine learning and AI, they're very finicky. They expect data to be in a certain format, it needs to be convenient to leverage quickly and manipulate uh, uh, very, very fast. Uh, the AI algorithms themselves are fragile, so the dependency on data is huge. And most of the action, how is the data represented really? Right? So a lot of the effort goes into representing the data so that the algorithm knows how to solve it, uh, which is basically a lot of human input into that ingenuity. So let's take a few case studies here and, and do our lessons in the context, the remaining lessons in the context of these. Uh, here's an example uh, of something we did when I was at Barclays. Uh, this is Barclays Africa Retail Banking. Um, we wanted to kind of, uh, the bank was charging people for doing overdrafts. And a lot of these people couldn't even afford the charges. Uh, you know, what we did is added an ability to kind of compute and predict that, hey, based on your spending habits and what we see about your income coming into the bank, uh, we predict you're gonna hit a uh, overdraft situation in say two weeks or three weeks. The minute we detect that, we actually send an SMS and say, hey, uh, we think you're going to go into overdraft, click here to uh, avoid charges. And in a typical SMS campaign, 1% uh, is considered a reasonable response rate. 2% uh, would be amazing, right? 5% would be great. Here, the response rate is 60%, right? which shows you that the message was very relevant. It was timely. Uh, and, and you got a lot of people kind of responding to those predictions very quickly with a lot of uh, press coverage of it. Uh, Barclays Africa then went on and, and did this to try to move people to the uh, digital channel. So uh, instead of, you know, instead of waiting to the traditional systems was you wait until you recognize somebody went to the branch. By the time you kind of construct your list and send them a message, it's been two or three weeks or a month. And you say, hey, remember a month ago when you visited the branch, the response rate is obviously very, very low. But if you actually hit them while they're visiting the branch and say, hey, you could have avoided this trip to the branch, by the way, and could have done this on the mobile or on your internet. Um, the uptake was also uh, very, uh, very much higher than typical campaigns. Again, relevance due to timeliness. Uh, credit limit increases. We would uh, uh, decide on the fly whether to increase somebody's credit limit while they're shopping for small amounts. Again, huge uptake and, and very good reviews. Um, another beautiful experience here had to do with um, chatbots that I talked about. Uh, this is with one of the largest uh, uh, providers of um, retirement uh, uh, accounts. Uh, their uh, financial advisors kind of will sit with customers for 20 minute sessions to kind of refresh their information, etc. cetera. Um, we worked with them to actually say, hey, that 20 minute session, by the way, can be reduced to five minutes. Uh, by doing a lot of uh, self-help using a chatbot, but it had to be an intelligent chatbot. Um, and uh, not only did the customers love it, uh, I mean, the, the advisors, of course, love it because it's five minutes instead of 20 with the same information. The customers loved it because it's five minutes relevant and we pulled data that is already known to make it easier on them. And uh, in a duration of five weeks with a cost of less than 200K to run this uh, 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 experiment with the chatbot, the benefits were $5 million, right? Because and if you think about it, that's the, a lot of time of a lot of financial advisors and a lot of goodwill with customers because you're asking them to uh, bear a smaller burden. Of course, it was very important that the chatbot be intelligent. Uh, it understands kind of uh, the way that humans like to talk about it, uh, to it, right? And doesn't get stuck when you go kind of off track uh, so that was the big contribution there, and that's where AI can play a good role. Uh, so lesson four, AI operations should model processes and aim to understand intent, uh, which leads to understanding the actors and what they want to achieve. So the question now is, you know, do you have an architecture that allows you to understand intent? Some companies have an easy time with this, like Google search. You go there and you tell it what your intent is, right? You say, here, in my search box, I'm typing to you what I want to say. A um, uh, couple of more case studies quickly here. Um, one in, 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 in insurance digitization, we'll share the slides, so I'll, I'll, I'll skip over some of these. Uh, but basically several examples of kind of uh, insurance companies going digital only and actually achieving huge business growth because they can satisfy a lot of what the customers 
uh, need fast. Uh, a lot of thinking in a lot of companies around digitizing that customer journey, right? Used to be that when you uh, want to file a claim, say for your auto insurance, uh, they'd have to send somebody to examine it, et cetera. Nowadays, if you do the math, you notice that, hey, if, if we take pictures and we have ways of triangulating this with data, we can avoid that whole visit. We can approve most of these quicker, which gives us uh, better uh, relationships with our customers and reduce our costs, uh, believe it or not. So a lot of uh, uh, opportunities here for injecting intelligence in, in the micro level at uh, different uh, uh, parts of the process. So I shared with you the first four lessons. The fifth and the last one, probably the most important, is there is no autonomous AI. There is no general AI. It is about human-centered AI, systems that help humans perform much of the low-level work quickly and accurately and amplifying their abilities, right? So anybody who comes to you and tries to sell you uh, on autonomous AI, they're probably selling you hype. Um, it doesn't exist yet. Maybe one day it will. Um, we said there's a huge dependence on data and we have a big data problem in a lot of the uh, 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 organizations out there. Um, business expects data to be reliable, affordable, timely, accurate, comprehensive, unified, accessible, easy to understand, easy to embed in the business. Reality is most of these don't hold, right? It's unreliable, low quality, expensive, uh, unusable often, very confusing, incomplete, and, and, and uh, uh, no unstructured data. Uh, big data promises to help this. Uh, we experienced this, say, at Barclays, where we kind of built something for cybersecurity that took data from all over the place uh, through a, a big data lake and, and through a, a big data stack. <clears throat> but the minute we had it going for cybersecurity, many other places like financial crime wanted to leverage it, then fraud detection, which is a big problem for a bank, uh, then marketing groups, uh, risk and finance, et cetera. Uh, and, and you know the minute that data was collected and the minute you showed the ability to put it together in an economic model that works, it suddenly became a very valuable asset. Uh, we have a whole philosophy as to how we do this. It's important to have a data strategy that is grounded in kind of what are the revenue benefits, what's the relevance, what's the reference, regulation and so forth, and what is the roadmap to take you from current state to where you wanna be. Uh, and we've, we've kind of done this exercise with many, many, many companies, and that usually guides you on that AI journey because you need to figure out those AI use cases and figure out which uh, data sets you go after and how, how do you represent them? How do you make sure they represent what you need? Uh, so the whole idea here that you need to be thinking about is, is data under control because that's the biggest enabler and is it driving business growth? And that's where AI comes in and, and a lot of this machine learning if you have the right data at quality, available and easy to access under the right constraints, of course, uh, you can make a lot of value uh, happen. And these are some of the diagnostic questions uh, you can ask. I'm a big believer in, in a data as a service model where you kind of centralize that data and you make sure it has built-in governance, built-in standards and quality. And through that, then you activate a whole bunch of uh, nice solutions. Uh, through the years, we've learned a lot of hard lessons, um, and we had our philosophy to change the game, to democratize it. You know, it doesn't have to break the budgets. You can make it more affordable uh, through the, the new uh, open source stack, uh, garbage in, garbage out. So you got to work on quality as a process, data quality, uh, structured data only. By extending that into unstructured, you gain access to that other 90% of the data that you're not using. Uh, and then don't try to boil the ocean, right? Do it always in a very narrow, very narrow uh, use case, but build towards a reference architecture. Know what you're trying to build towards in the strategy, but then do these very thin slices where you support uh, each. And of course, the biggest problem here is lack of talent, which is another thing we're doing at the Institute for Experiential AI, is kind of getting folks to go through an experiential education that couples the learnings from the formal training with the experience of actually solving real projects in our AI solutions factory in order to actually address this issue of, of talent that really knows that, hey, when I give you the data, probably one third of it is wrong, a quarter of it is missing, and, and you know, good luck to you, how do you make this work, right? Uh, that's where a lot of the uh, uh, benefits come in. Um, 
I'm going to skip these slides actually. Uh, I talked here about the importance of having a unified customer view um, and, and a way to build it systematically so you understand what's, what's going on. Um, uh, it has to be something that's easy to utilize, easy to discover, easy to plug in to systems, and it's an overlay that grabs data from a lot of systems and makes it available in ways that are easy to kind of parse, read, and leverage. Um, I, I will end with one last case study very quickly, um, just to show you the power of putting this right data sets together. So this is work we did at Barclays um, of both having kind of payments data. So Barclays sees a lot of the payments activity in the UK uh, because of their uh, point of sale systems and their Barclays card and their debit card. Uh, but we also grab data from uh, social media and other places to try to figure out uh, behaviors financially and how do they map to passions, which is what you do online. Uh, so we would go to an insurance company without even meeting them and tell them ahead of time, hey, by the way, uh, here is how people compare, say, in London on how many people are eating out, this is pre-pandemic, uh, versus their spend on, on gas, right? Um, people who left you, um, here is where they hang out online. People who switched, uh, sorry, yeah, on the right, people who, who are switchers, here's where they hang out online. So you may want to think about what messages you put there. People who are loyal, here's where they hang out. You might want to think about the messaging there. But more importantly, without even talking to them, we could tell, hey, these people switch their insurance provider from this company, Aviva in this case, to somebody else, right? And or they came from somebody else and went to Aviva. That kind of, this kind of chart kind of blew their mind. Like, wh where did you get this data? And how do you know this? How do you know who switched and where did they went and, and all of that? And all I'm saying is that data is available and, and possible to get. Um, there are several case studies here we don't have time for. Some of my favorites happen to be in uh, unstructured data kind of leveraging. This is working with one of the biggest retailers out there. Um, can we utilize the open source stack um, to do things that used to be research projects only five to 10 years ago, uh, solve them in a few months today, right? Monitoring what's happening to the cash in the store from the cash register all the way to loading it in the trucks and cash management is a huge problem for stores. Uh, accident and security risk recognition, you know, somebody fell or there was a near accident. Security and surveillance analysis, right? Um, what's a threat, what's an issue? Uh, near miss analytics for preventative safety, right? A lot of these things only get logged when they cause harm to an employee or a customer, but often you have like many near misses which never get logged that are important to address uh, ahead of time. So a lot of that comes from kind of intelligently being able to parse the video that's already being collected in the store anyway, as part of the standard uh, uh, routines. Uh, so the themes I tried to cover in this talk AI is becoming an imper imperative in the digital age, but challenging to make work. Uh, no data leads to no working AI, so you must have a data story. Uh, digitization, a lot more data, and a lot of it is unstructured. Uh, I think that's very good news for, for AI because that's, that's the space where AI can add a lot of help. Uh, getting the data story right is a key enabler in all of these AI projects, by the way. And uh, you have to have a data strategy. You have to have a, a, something like a data in a service as a service where you can rely on the data because the garbage in, garbage out uh, always holds. This is a reminder of the five lessons. Make it narrow so you can have complete knowledge. Gather the data because it's important. It needs to be in the right format for a machine, not just for human consumption. And you need to figure out intent from that data uh, and understand it. Um, we said that AI is highly dependent on ML, ML is highly dependent on data, and AI applications are subjects to bias and reliable data, all that stuff. So it's very important to do responsible AI. It's very important to think about ethical issues. Are you doing it right? Are you doing unintended consequences? Um, and, you know, data is really the hidden part of uh, the most expensive part of doing an AI project that people don't think about and get stuck on. Um, I'll end with my uh, analogy of the great divide. Uh, what's been happening in the world of AI is you have this world of AI halves. You have these companies on one side of the divide who have been using data 
you know, if you're a retailer today trying to do compete with Amazon, Amazon has been doing AI on data for 20 years, right? So AI brings in better data, better data brings in better AI, AI brings in better data, and that virtual cycle is going. In the meantime, most companies are on the other bank, are watching at a distance as that divide increases. And part of what we're doing with the Institute for Experiential AI and, and part of my life mission really is to, how do we democratize this technology? How do we enable the majority of companies to kind of catch up in rational ways? How do you cross that dangerous divide and, and get to uh, solutions that work? So probably with that, I've, I've hit the uh, time limit here and I'd like to leave time for questions. Um, there's some diagnostic questions here that gives you kind of pieces to the big picture. Uh, I'll give you uh, links here to what we're doing at the Institute for Experiential AI, where we're building an AI solutions factory uh, to solve problems uh, in a co-creation model with our partners and to use that to train the next generation of talent on real applications, what it takes to make them work, what it takes to solve them, and then challenge our researchers to say, well, where it doesn't work and it doesn't solve the problem, how do we advance the state of the art so we can address that? So probably with that, I will uh, turn it over to questions. I'm happy to answer any and all questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fayed. Uh, really, as always, appreciate your insights and wisdom. Um, we uh, have, have a, a bunch of questions, both from uh, the RSVP page and some direct questions we received during the session. Uh, I wanted to start out with one um, about well-established companies. So how would you position a well-established company with an immature data culture to make the most out of AI to boost the revenue? Yeah, I mean, the, 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 uh, I, I think, by the way, the, the uh, AI to a well-established companies, and in the, to me, the, the key here is find the problem that matters. You know, what is, what is the opportunity? And again, we said, Successful AI is highly dependent on data. So at the end of the day, uh, what data sets do you need? Are you collecting them appropriately? And how do you formulate that catalog of opportunities where you say, okay, this is my highest uh, priority opportunity. Uh, let me go after it. And um, I, I believe the silver bullet is, it's not the techniques, it's not the algorithms, it's really the ability to scope that problem. Remember that narrowness is very important. Scope the problem so that you can solve, you can reach value to the business within three months. Three months is, seems to be the magical number that says not only gets the business engaged, but gets the business to generate more appetite to say, I wanna do more. So the way I would start that journey is to, to identify the use case, the application that delivers probably the highest value in that short time framework. And if, even if it's a big scope, you can always reduce the scope and deliver part of that value and show it. But it's important to have the credibility, uh, figure out what data you need to feed into it. Um, of course, would love to have the opportunity to work with you to accelerate that AI journey and deliver a solution and then start that virtuous cycle because the minute you see it working, a, you demystify the technology so people begin to understand, aha, this is what it takes to work. By the way, this is not black magic. This is actually makes sense, right? Uh, and second of all, um, seeing the value drives kind of the budgets, drives the attention and gives you a competitive advantage. So for established companies, this is the key, in my opinion, to the future. This, this, this next century is for sure the century of data and the data is so complex that it needs AI and AI is just fancy computing models that allow you to manipulate more complex data and, and get to the right answer today as we strive to solve the bigger problems of intelligence. So my advice is start simple, define a project, define the priority, show that it can be solved and then do the next one and the next one and the next one soon enough. You're a big player in, in AI without even declaring it. To me, that's the magic. That's great. And running on that same line of a well-established company, uh, there's another question about um, should a company with a consolidated and very capable IT department opt for third-party solutions with vendors that are out of the box? 
uh, for AI and ML frameworks, or is it better in some way to implement these from, from scratch uh, within house? Well, that is, that is a great question. There's no need. No. I wouldn't build stuff from scratch when reliable solutions exist. I do think though, there is a degree of uniqueness to every project that has to do with the fact that, you know, plug and play uh, doesn't quite work today in AI. There's always some issue. There's always a problem with the data. There's always a problem with the implementation. There's always a cultural issue of how do you make it work? So to me, it's really about kind of identifying that narrow scope, finding the tools and leveraging, work with somebody. I mean, what we do at the AI Solutions Factory is we leverage everything available in open source. We work with vendors too. Uh, if somebody has a great handwriting recognition uh, tool, uh, I don't need to spend my time trying to reinvent handwriting recognition. I leverage it and deliver on the value that comes out of having that capability. Same with speech recognition, same with chatbots, same with a lot of this available technology. So absolutely leverage it, but you have to have that talent that understands it because at some point you have to maintain it, you have to build on it. So it's a mix and you need the people who've been exposed, which is why we're such great believers in the experiential education by creating that opportunity to, for students, for learners, to go through a supervised apprenticeship in the AI Solutions Factory, we're helping our partner companies essentially elevate and train the skills of their existing employees and potentially their new people. They, they would love to hire a lot of the students also who are going through that experience, especially ones who show passion for that kind of problem. Uh, so that's the co-working model that I refer to that I think works really well, but absolutely leverage the tools that are out there. The key is going to be in understanding the data, understanding the problem and understanding what's unique here and what needs to be changed, right? So it's, it's not the tools, it's the way you use those tools and it's the way you kind of prepare and clean that data. That's key. That's great, thank you. Shifting gears a little bit, uh, you know, we talked about larger companies, but how about smaller companies? What are there systems and processes that you would recommend putting in place prior to a phase of rapid growth um, that will help prepare, leverage machine learning and AI once, uh, once they have larger amounts of data? Yeah, so there's, there's smaller companies versus startups, right? So the good news is for startups, especially ones with, with funding, uh, they're kind of born digital and born, uh, I would call it almost AI native nowadays. Right? So they, you know, out of the gate, they know what's out there. They know how to leverage it. They're going after it. In a small business that's established and trying to kind of grow, that's where it's critical to kind of figure out because you don't have access to that funding that the VC is providing in a startup or something like that. You need to kind of have a rational model. And yes, I absolutely believe that for small businesses, this is a key. You need to pick up these uh, uh, new technologies to stay competitive, to stay relevant, to avoid effectively uh, being washed away by the bigger players who will soon enough, as soon as they leverage these technologies, they can start going after the niche markets where the small businesses excel. And that's why it's important to pick it up, but you need to pick it up in a model that kind of works. And, and that's why I'm a big believer and kind of this, this co-working model through our AI solutions factory, because whether you're a small business uh, or a big business, you can benefit from the talent, the know-how and the research capabilities that we have, as well as the, the training uh, of, of the right talent to get the right talent in place. It's much more challenging for a small business to do it because you know, the budgets are not there and, and it's big challenges and you know, it's, it's, it's challenging enough just to stay alive day to day. But at the same time, the advantage you have as a small business is you can innovate faster with a lot less bureaucracy to deal with than in a big established company where the uh, inertia of this is how we do stuff kind of really takes over and makes it hard to innovate. So you got to play that. And, and in this new age, you have to embrace data and AI. It's an absolute must. So it's, it's critical to the survival of that small business. Absolutely. So I think we have time maybe for one more, um, maybe a more uh, philosophical question. Um, someone asked, uh, data is a proxy for patterns that seem to uh, drive human behavior. Um, so what happens when these data patterns shift? Are, are there any trends that you've seen, um, especially in the case of COVID? 
Um, yeah, I mean, look, models, I, the good news is if you're, if you're building models based on data, as the data changes, assuming you're refreshing your models and you're not sort of, kind of trusting them and leaving them alone, um, maybe that should be the sixth lesson here. Um, you know, that, that, that you should be, you ought to be able to detect that your model is no longer valid. And that's a very uh, important question uh, because a lot of the traps, and I should really add this as another lesson learned, a lot of the traps is you kind of invest in an AI solution, you build a predictive model, then you trust it. And then things change. And this model doesn't tell you, hey, the world has changed on me. So the ability to monitor and understand that the model is no longer healthy, it needs a major refresh, or this is no longer working, it's kind of lost its efficacy. Very important. So monitoring models in production is a big deal. Uh, it doesn't get enough attention out there, um, and it's important uh, to deal with it. The other part that's important also, which is why um, you know I would say half of what we do also at the Institute for Experiential AI is worry about things like responsible AI, meaning are you introducing biases that are potentially horrible and can come back and cause you huge damage without you knowing it? Um, are you uh, uh, using the data that you're allowed to use? Do you have the right opt-ins? Um, how do you deal with ethical issues when they come up? Uh, those are more important for more advanced applications, but they are very important. A uh, big part of responsible AI is also explainable AI. How do we explain why a model works, why it doesn't work, and when does it fail? Uh, so those are all areas of concern that we spend a lot of time and energy on. And it's very important to get to, you know, our bigger vision here is trustworthy AI, which is AI you can trust to be resilient, but you can also trust from the social perspective, from reliability, from understandability, et cetera. Wonderful. Well, we've hit our time mark here. Um, thank you again, Dr. Fayed. We really appreciate your time. Uh, thank you everyone for joining this call. Uh, whether you're interested in learning more about the Brew Institute at Northeastern University, or staying updated on AI trends, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out, engage with us on social media. Um, for those of you looking for applied solutions to real, real business problems, the AI Solutions Factory is at, at the Institute for Experiential AI is, is ready to work with you. Um, so please reach out to me, I'll help you find the right team at Northeastern to get started. Uh, and finally, we'll follow up with contact information, ways you can meet Usama and his team, um, we will also follow up with the questions we didn't get to. Um, thank you all for posting those. Um, and I'll be sharing a very brief survey, your feedback, uh, always uh, much appreciated. So thanks again, everyone. And I hope you have a great day. We're so glad you could make it for this. Thank you.